What Now, America? With Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. And now, Archbishop Sheen. Fellow Americans, did you notice the beauty of that theme song? I must tell you about it. When I first started television, I asked Mr. Fritz Chrysler, the famous violinist, to do me a theme song. And he gave me a number of his compositions, and he said, now, choose any one you want, and you may copyright the one that you choose. So I had some musicians play the various ones, and the one that I liked was entitled Vienna March. And I said to Mr. Chrysler, Mr. Chrysler, I can't march on the stage, so we'll have to change this to a waltz. <laughs> and he said, it, it can't be done. It just can't be done. Well, I said, try it. So he sat down at the piano in his living room, and tried about two bars. And he said, see, I told you, it can't be done. It would spoil the music. With that, Mrs. Chrysler said, tonight he's in one of his no moods. So she said, Fritz, come here. So Fritz followed her out of the room and they went down the long corridor. And at the other end of the corridor was another music room. And a short time later, I heard coming from that room the strains of that music in waltz time. Never underestimate the power of a woman. <laughs> so this is now our theme song, which we've had for these years. And though I wanted something that was very beautiful, I don't know anything about music and I can't sing, and I must tell you about that. I was once visiting Grace Moore. Remember Grace Moore, the very famous metropolitan star and movie star? And we were seated alongside of her swimming pool in Connecticut. And after I'd been talking about five minutes, Grace said, I haven't heard a word you said. I was listening to your voice. You have a nice voice. Well, I said, Grace, if I have a nice voice, why can't I sing? She said, have you ever tried? Well, what priest hasn't? <laughs> and she said, what is your favorite opera? I said, Faust. And what is your favorite duet? I said, Ange Pierre, Ange Radieux. She said, all right, now let's sing it together. Now, if you remember that particular duet, in round numbers, it goes up 18 and seven-eighths octaves each verse. So Grace and I started singing that duet, and her voice just rang out over the Connecticut countryside. And when we got to the end of it, or the middle of it, she stopped and said, you're right, you can't sing. <laughs> now you have to find out whether or not I can talk. We are, as you know, giving about 13 vignettes about American life. And this particular subject will be the anatomy of violence. We are a violent America. We were not that way at the beginning. At the end of our Revolutionary War, we disbanded our army. Our colonial fathers didn't want to have an army of men carrying guns. The only gun that was needed in colonial life was a rifle that was over the fireplace. And so we disbanded our army, our navy, and our merchant marine. Thomas Jefferson, in discussing government with 
the French Revolution to Saint-Just, disagreed with him. Saint-Just said the only way that you can ever build up a government is on a pile of corpses. Jefferson said no. He said governments are relative. Politics are not absolute. There may be parties. So he refused to subscribe to violence. But then came the burning of witches, slavery, and today we are a violent America. Now let me give you some figures to prove it. And these figures are from the FBI, and they carry over a 10-year period. Here we will speak, first of all, of men. The arrest of men for serious crimes, serious crimes, rose in 10 years from 81% to 256%. Men were Serious crimes of women have gone up from 203% to 388 women. Evidently, in the unisex culture, we believe that they too should be just as aggressive and as violent as men. And thus, we're both liberated from decency. Now let's take youth under 18. The crime, increase of crime of youth under 18 has increased over 300%. And there's been a greater increase in the crime of girls than there has been of men. Now take, for example, certain crimes that have been committed in our national life lately. In the Chelsea of product, I mean project in New York City, there have been 20 women between the ages of 80 and 92 that have been mugged, beaten, and robbed by young kids, the average age of which was 13. The oldest was a girl of 15 in Boston. A couple of boys saw a young woman on this roadway carrying a gallon of gasoline back to her car. She had run out of gas. They poured the gasoline over her and then set fire to her. She was burned to death. But he said, why did you do it? Oh, we saw it on television. Which brings up the question, and as regards violence on television, first of all, the University of Pennsylvania stated that one half of the scenes on television involve violence of some kind. But television says no. Uh, the showing of violence on television doesn't mean that the children, when they see it, are going to be violent. They say, this is wrong. Sure, we have men and women being killed, women being mugged, raped, and so forth. But when the young people see this, they're not going to imitate it. No, they're not. Let's see. Why then does TV accept advertising? Why are they going to accept, for example, in a movie that was just bought by NBC for $10 million for one showing, why are they going to charge the sponsors $250,000 a minute? If they do not think that the advertising of cars or soap or automobiles or whatever it is, is not going to put that idea into the mind of the viewers. 
So we have become a violent country. The most astounding figure of all was given by a Professor Barnett of MIT. Now he put this in his computer and I give the institution, give his name because the figures are so, so startling. He says that any baby that is born in any of the 60 cities of the United States this year will have a 2% chance of being murdered. The chances, the professor says, of that babe being murdered during his life are far greater than any soldier in World War II being killed in combat. That's our violence. What causes it? Well, one reason is every sex-mad or carnal age is a violent age. Professor Sorokin has traced this through history. Why is that? Why is an age which is bent on pleasure, particularly erotic pleasure, why is it a destructive, aggressive age? Well, one of the reasons is that all our body sensations decrease as time goes on and with use. For example, if I had the habit of clicking my fingernails, for example, during a telecast, well, you might hear it, and then after a while you pay no attention to it. It would require a greater click. We'd have to bring in a cricket in order that you might notice the click. As a matter of fact, there were a couple of psychiatrists, or rather psychologists, a few years ago, tried to prove that as you increase a sensation, one, two, three, four, five, you have to increase the stimulus, two, four, eight, sixteen. It always requires a greater and greater excitement. Finally, you get into masochism, into violence, the cream passionnel. And that's our madness for sensation. And particularly of the body order is driving us to ever and ever greater stimulus to get an excitement. One of the reasons why death so often follows a raping. A second reason is we all have guilt in our souls. We deny it, and we will talk about that later. But we all have sins, things that we have done for which we are very ashamed. We know that we ought to be punished. So we like to see violence on television. We like to see someone cracked in the jaw, knocked over with a club, hit by a bullet, anything, because we see now vicarious satisfaction of our own guilt. He is taking the punishment that I deserve. Otherwise, there wouldn't be this love for violence that there is in our theater and on our television. But these reasons are not really as important as this one. And this is very basic and fundamental. The ultimate reason for violence in our culture and civilization is the fact that Christians are no longer being Christian and not influencing the culture. That is true, in fact, for the whole Hebraic Christian tradition. What did the good Lord say about violence? He recommended it. Think of it. The kingdom of heaven is won by violence. And only the violent shall seize it. And again, I came not to bring peace, but the sword. 
Think of it. Bringing a sword, asking for violence. But the violence that he recommended is a different violence than the violence we have today. The violence that he recommended was not a violence that was directed against neighbor. It was a violence that was directed against self. The violence that he commended and the sword that he recommended was not the sword that swung outward like Peter's hacking off the ear of a servant of a high priest. It was the sword that was thrust inward to cut out our pride and covetousness and lust and anger and envy and gluttony and sloth. In other words, the violence that he recommended was self-discipline. Self-denial, the crushing of evil instincts for the sake of the betterment of man. And that violence has been neglected. Discipline has passed out of our American life. About the only place the discipline is left is the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, and the professional football fields. And now even they are getting away from it. We do not have it in our schools, in our seminaries, in our homes. So the violence that we are to have is the violence of self-denial. And as we neglect to practice that self-denial and that interior violence, as we drop it, the streets pick it up. The muggers lay hold of it. The rapists practice it. They are doing violence to their neighbor instead of violence to themselves. That's the reason we have so much violence in our streets. Everything we drop, the world picks up and then perverts. And not until America begins to restore in her schools and family life some self-denial. Not until then where we take violence off our streets. Now, what are the advantages of this kind of, of violence and self-denial? Well, first of, it, first of all, it develops our character. The only way that we can ever, ever unfold what is best in us is by crushing what is base. And that requires violence. It's very much like a violin. A violinist will tighten the strings. If the string were conscious, the string would say, don't do that. It hurts me. But the violinist would say, yes. But it's in order to bring out the better melody. Character development is somewhat like sculpturing. In order to release that form that is inside of marble, one takes a hammer and chisel and cuts off huge chunks of egotism. And then by finer and more delicate touches, and even the brush of a hand is the character revealed. And keeping to sculpture as an example, let's go back to Michelangelo and find out. I have nine minutes left. Thank you, I didn't see that before. I was wondering when, how, where my time was going and I didn't see a marker. Take, for example, Michelangelo. Michelangelo one day saw on the streets of Florence a beautiful piece of Carrara marble that had been hacked and cut and ruined by some cheap artist. He asked that it be brought to a studio, applied his chisel, his genius, his inspiration, and drew out of it the immortal statue of David. And that's the way. Cheap, ruined lives can be reformed provided they restore that violence which is at equal to the development of character. There's still an unfinished piece of sculpture by Michelangelo. 
It was to be the tomb of Julius II. And if you ever saw it, there are four characters just emerging, emerging from the cold stone. They're only half formed. And that's the way many of us are. Just half formed, half developed. Our personality has not yet reached its perfection. And it needs a little more chiseling, a little more violence. But you say, but we're not to repress ourselves. That repression will give us neurosis. Nonsense. You never have a repression without an expression. And you never have an expression without a repression. Suppose I repress a tendency or an urge to rob a bank. If I repress that, what do I do? I express honesty. Just think of what our society would be if we felt that any kind of discipline was wrong. Imagine, for example, a mugger. Just after he's violated this particular woman, the police came up, come up to him and say, my good young man, too long have we been under the mid-Victorian ideas. We have the greatest admiration in law for anyone who expresses himself. I dread to contemplate what would happen to you if you had ever restrained this tendency to rape. That would cause a neurosis in you. And we bless you for it. Nonsense. And not until we begin to repress the evil that is in us. Will we begin to make a sound and better America? As a matter of fact, we very often have to do violence to our immediate needs in order to achieve an ultimate goal. Let me tell you a story about myself. When I finished college, I won a scholarship. It was to four years and three years in a university, leading to a PhD. And I was very anxious to get a PhD and go through a university. And the summer after my graduation, I went to see my professor of philosophy. And with great joy, I said, Father Bergen, I won the scholarship. Now I'm going to the university. He laid his hand on my shoulders and he said, listen. Do you believe in God? I said, of course I do. He said, I mean practically, do you believe in God? I said, well, I hope I do. He said, you know what you should do. You should go away to the seminary. You have a vocation for the priesthood. And you should not delay it. Follow it at once. I said, how about the scholarship? He said, tear it up. I said, no, I'll, I'll go to the seminary when I get my PhD. No, he said, tear it up. I tore it up. Went to the seminary. You know what happened? As a result of that violence to my wishes... I had six years of postgraduate work later on in the best universities in America and in Europe. The violence that I did to myself paid off. And then furthermore, when we understand this inner violence, we absorb evil. Take, for example, the the words of the Divine Lord, of, if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn also the left. You know, this would be a good spot, wouldn't it, for a commercial? I needed that. <laughs> well, without naming the product. Standing, being hit on the right cheek, you are to turn the left. Now, why is that? Well, suppose there are ten men here, and I 
preach hate and violence to them. Now I said, turn around, hit your neighbor. And everyone turns around, hits the neighbor on the right cheek. Finally, when they get to the eighth man, he turns around and hit on the left cheek. He stops it. Violence does not continue when there's that kind of, of charity and love. And in conclusion, then, our anatomy of violence is we have become violent because America has given up the development of character and self-discipline. We have too much in our American life of that gesture, the clenched fist. That clenched fist stands for hatred and for violence and for destruction. It is the one gesture of man that takes this symbol of art and turns it into the claw of a beast. This symbol has to be overcome by another one. The folded hands. Folded hands cannot strike, for they were not made for offense. They cannot protect, for they were not made for defense. They can only imprecate, only pray. The carnal decade, ten Gothic spires spiring upward for the souls of men. And by and through the folded hands of America by those, may those clenched fists release their hate. And all of those who belong to the race of Cain will then understand how much sweetness there is in the violence to the lower self that makes for the majesty of the image of God. Thank you, bye, and God love you.